Good morning, friends. If you're wondering why I haven't posted content for a long time, I think it's been about a month at least, maybe longer. Uh, I've just been insanely busy. First, it was packaging orders from Scion and Seed Sales, which have been uh, what was amazing, amazing. I got a good chunk of money in the bank for uh, buying land. Just an incredible amount of work. Uh, I'm going to get help with that next year for sure. Collecting pollen. I have pollen in the store now. Like every couple of days I'll collect pollen and just list whatever I've collected. So it's just been kind of an ongoing stream. Uh, sowing seeds, taking down a giant greenhouse of uh, 30 by 50 with 8 foot walls. A huge steel greenhouse frame and lots and lots of pollinating. This year I'm going to have the most interesting, I think, crosses ever. I'm using a lot of my own parents. I have a lot better idea, you know, than when I started of what I want to be crossing. I have some new things I'm pursuing. I'm using a new method. So this morning before I run out to work on the greenhouse, I wanted to do a quick run around and show you how I'm pollinating this year, kind of talk about how I did it before, what your options are and what kind of the advantages and disadvantages are of different methods and how controlled they are too. Because my uh, thinking informed by experience and talking to other breeders and stuff has, you know, I've changed quite a bit how I approach it now. And this is what I'm doing now. So I'm bagging whole sections of limb, right? So when this was in bloom, or starting to come into bloom, I would just go over a branch, take off any flowers that were already open. So that way I can just take off the bag every day, pollinate the blossoms, and then put the bag back on. Really, you don't need to do it more than every other day. I think every third day may be enough, but you know, in the beginning, I kind of went extra hard on it. So some of the advantages of this, are that there's complete exclusion. I'm gonna end up with probably a ton of fruit because and seeds because I'm pollinating a lot more at once with very little work, right? All I have to do is take off the open blossoms, bag it, and then I know that anything that's opening is gonna be pollinated by whatever I'm putting onto the, uh, the branch. And we'll see how they did. Like this one doesn't look like it did very well. That could be from old pollen incompatible pollen, um, you know, who knows. So like this golden russet cross didn't do that well, but that could be really old pollen. This hard candy cider looks better. I see some stuff in there that looks like it took. Uh, we'll see, we're gonna find out in about a week, I'll know a lot more. The other thing I did this year is I made uh, controls. So this is a control where I just bagged some blossoms to see if they would self pollinate. So one of the reasons I started doing this and I stopped taking off the male parts of the flower. So let's look over here. So I used to actually, you know, before the blossom opened, I would take off all the petals when it was like in a, a popcorn balloon stage, kind of like that one right there. If you can see that, what's, that's not open. I would take off the petals and then take a little pair of scissors, tiny scissors, and nip off all these uh, pollen parts, the male parts, uh, to prevent self-pollination. The reason I stopped doing that is because I just knew that some apple breeders use this kind of bagging method or they'll bag the whole tree and then just uh, pollinate it once a day. Uh, that was good enough for me, so I just did that. But recently, Chris Hamanix told me that new genetic research shows that very few, if any, um, apples that exist now as cultivars are from self-pollinations and that's you know that's good enough for me because it saves a lot of work. I stopped taking off the male parts but I still took off the petals and then I would pollinate it and I figured that bees were going to leave it alone if it looked like this you know like the flowers were already done. But then one day I was pollinating I think last year and I saw a bee while I was pollinating something else I saw a bee land on the flowers I had taken the petals off so apparently they could smell it or whatever so you know they're going to get some cross contamination or if my pollen didn't take maybe their pollen takes and then I don't know what parent I'm getting. So I did that for a while and then last year I was like okay I'm just going to bag everything because I got these organza bags they're really easy to use I'll show you later but you can just uh, pull the strings and leave it hanging you don't have to tie it or anything it's super fast they come in different sizes different colors 
and uh, they're a real game changer. So I figured I'd bag everything and go to this method. The little bit I had done of this uh, the, the last couple of years worked really well using pollen blends. So I'd bag like a big branch and open it and put these pollen blends like red flesh blend, early blend, late blend. So let's go uh, pollinate a couple branches on Rubiot because it's a late bloomer and it still needs some pollinating. Okay, so also this year, about halfway through the season, I got tired of sorting through, like, I had all the seed packets laid, or the pollen packets laid out in a flat basket, and I would just look through them, and it's so, it's so confusing and hard. Like, you'd think it'd be easy with all the, the names facing up to find what you want, but it really isn't. And I was spending an incredible amount of time just doing that, so I made this little pollen caddy finally. We're going to get Pinker Lady here, which is one of my crosses pink lady rubiot or rubiot pink lady and we're going to put that back onto rubiot right here okay so i have my little packet the q-tip's already in here so i take the q-tip out stick it in my teeth i don't want this bag off any longer than necessary because uh bees will come in right away sometimes and land and start doing their thing. So I'm always watching for bees and like shooing them away. Okay, so on this one we have some stuff that opened recently. Like this looks really fresh. Um, you can see that the anthers here are still yellow, uh, you know, and when the flowers really spent, they'll turn brown, kind of like this. So these aren't very fresh. They may still be pollinatable, um, but I don't really know. So I try to get them well before that. Now this was pollinated yesterday, but you know, it doesn't hurt. That's one advantage of this is I'm pollinating all the blossoms more than once. And in the past I've not done that. And I think I get higher takes this way. And I'm, you know, there's a lot of pollen on this brush. You don't need much pollen. You know, if you, it looks like there's not much pollen on your brush, there's probably a lot more than you think. Okay, now this one, like back under here, is much fresher. Looks like those really just opened maybe today or late yesterday. But I do this pretty quick, you know? I'm not spending a ton of time. I'm not really looking. You know, if your eyesight's good enough, you can certainly, you know, try to hit the female parts more, but I just kind of do like a bee and just rub all over the place. So one of the disadvantages, potentially, I mean, you could see it either way, is that I'm getting cross-contamination on my brush. So I've opened this bag. The newly opened blossoms haven't been visited by bees, and they're not wind-pollinated. You know, they're insect-pollinated, so the, a lot of the pollen is still on here. So I'm getting rubyot pollen in my pink or lady pollen. I kind of see that as an advantage because I like having these wild-card crosses, but they're not open-pollinated, right? It's not just pollinated by any random apple here because most of the apples I have I would not use for breeding. I'm just contaminating with stuff that I'm breeding with anyway. Now it's really fun and I think very fruitful to figure out like what seems like a good cross, but you, we really can't guess what the apples are going to turn out like. So I actually like having this kind of wild card thing where maybe a seed in each one of these or a couple seeds here and there are pollinated by something completely different but it does take a little bit of that control out. Now the option would be that I would use a different brush every pollination, right? So I would have to, you know, save this maybe in a different packet that said Rubiot. So I knew I was just pollinating the Rubiot with it, or I would throw the, the thing away, which is like tons of pollen. So that's, I really can't afford to do that. I would have to collect a whole lot more pollen I'd have to keep track of a lot more stuff. I'd need maybe more packets or more little pollinator things. And that's just really not in the cards for me. So I think this is fine, but be warned that if you get seed from me, you know, there could be some other random wildcard pollinations. And I think that's pretty cool uh, because I, it's just gonna be with stuff I'm breeding with already and crosses that I, I would normally maybe not make. 
So these Organza bags come in different colors too and different sizes. Now I'm trying to buy them in different colors for different sizes so that I can easily see what size of bag it is. Like if I'm going through the, my box of bags, I can go, oh, I need that size, the yellow size, right? And just grab that. I'll, I'll put links to the bags that I've been buying. Um, I think they're up to 20 by, 20 by 12 or 20 by 16 or something is the biggest one that I have. So let's do this one, that's sunrise, because it looks like there's a lot of new blossoms opening. And we were looking for what? Oh, sunrise. So sweet 16, sunrise. I'm using sunrise a lot this year. Oh, I don't have a Q-tip in here, so I'll have to use my finger because uh, I didn't bring any Q-tips out. Or wait, maybe there's some in this pocket. Yes, covered in lint, but... And I don't like these Q-tips very much. They catch on the parts of the flower. The, a lot of the pollen gets buried into the cotton and lost. I think microfiber is probably the way to go, so I might buy some, like, microfiber makeup applicator things, which they make, like probably just perfect for this. It would work better and I'd lose less pollen. Okay, now these flowers back here look like they've been, you know, around the block. They're well pollinated, so in the future I won't even do those. Something like this that's just starting to open. I'll just poke the, usually just poke it in there if it'll fit. Don't say it. All right, go ahead and say it. Everybody loves that's what she said jokes. I got a joke for you though. Uh, why can't women do carpentry? Because they've all, always been told that this is six inches. <laughs> okay, so like on this one, um, in two days, that would be a good time to come back. You know, these three will definitely be open. These will be fully open and I can hit them again. The reason I'm using uh, Sunrise a lot, it's, it's just a really refined apple. You know, it's got really good texture. The flavor is very nice. It's not really strong. And you know, I just really enjoy eating them, but it's a really refined apple. So it's gonna bring some more like modern refined genes to Rubiot, which is still a little bit primitive, a little bit tannic. Um, at its best, Rubiot has a really good texture and Sunrise has an excellent texture, so I'm hoping that this cross will be fruitful and good for, you know, continued crossing just to get more, again, more refined genes into the line. So on this organza bag, like one of these strings broke while well, it's still working. So I just pull it like that and leave it. So it's very easy to take those off. So on this one, you know, I wasn't even gonna pollinate today, but I wanted to make this video on this one, like some of this stuff is just open and it's really receptive, but I just pollinated it yesterday morning. So I can afford to wait a day and save myself some work. So finally, I'm at the home stretch. Like basically it's this tree. I'm waiting for like one cluster of vanilla pink flowers to open. And that's pretty much it. Uh, finally done, just days and days of accumulated work over weeks here. To get this happening. I would like to, however, collect some ruby out pollen, so let's do that real quick. In the last month, I did try to do some day on the homestead type of content. Uh, the last couple days, I filmed some stuff, and then last night, I accidentally, when I went to edit it, I threw away all the files and, and emptied my trash. And the first thing I thought was, Phew, now I don't have to edit that and take the time from working on all this other important stuff I have to do because, you know, there's a whole new set of tasks that need to be done now. I was like, well, I could go like download a program to recover files and I was like, screw it. I don't have time to edit three hours of footage anyway, but I will try to get back to content soon. And I would like to be spending doing that almost full time right now because my channel's getting a lot of traction and I can leverage that to get more traction. I'm at the point where my channel could really grow if I do the right things. But, you know, I'm mired in projects, important projects, like keeping this whole thing going, getting pollen out to people. I was able to provide some cherry crush pollen this year, one or two packets of Appaloosa, 
There was no black strawberry this year because it didn't bloom, like not a single bloom. It just really overbore last year and it's taken the year off. Um, tons of grafting. So I grafted a lot of my seedling varieties out to propagate more cyan wood so I can get more of the cyan wood out uh, cheaper. So lots of Appaloosa, black strawberry, uh, amber wine, which I should be able to release this coming season. If everything goes well, lots of cherub. There's some packets of Rubiot left, but after this video, they'll probably sell out. So I'm just gonna do a couple more packets of this. And then again, the pollen season's winding down too, because the flowering season is winding down. And, you know, I can only get so much stuff out of certain varieties. I might be able to get some more cherry crush. We'll, we'll go take a look at that in a second. Um, but my friend's on her way up here to help me out with the greenhouse. We have limited time here. Okay, here's Cherry Crush. And this one, I've got a lot of pollinations onto this this year. I was gonna look around and see if I could scrounge a little more pollen, but it's pretty sparse. Like if I hunted hard, I might be able to get one more packet. Let's see, that one's okay. This one's okay. You wanna get these when they're still closed, but if they're slightly open, that's usually okay. Yeah, I was very happy that this bloomed well this year. A, I get to eat them. And B, I got to make a lot of good cross-pollinations. I have flaxen on here, uh, pink parfait, definitely cherry cox, wixen, black strawberry, Appaloosa, sweet 16. Sweet 16 is another cherry-flavored apple. So I'm putting, you know, Cherry Cox back onto Cherry Crush and Sweet 16 onto Cherry Crush, hoping to reinforce those genes. If anybody knows any other cherry flavored apples, I want them ASAP. So let me know what they are or if you can send me scions. That's it for Cherry Crush this year, but at least I got a few packets out. Wait, there's one there. Okay, so we might get like eight blossoms, which is kind of the minimum I try to do in a pollen packet. I prefer to do 10. Some packets have 12, but rare stuff, sometimes I'll only put in like six blossoms, which if it's a good pollen producer, that's still a ton of pollen. I mean, you can take one flower and get quite a bit of pollen out of it. And this is Appaloosa, so I did a lot of crosses on Appaloosa as well, but it's finished for the year. This fall, we're gonna have massive quantities of extremely interesting seeds. Best crosses ever. Let's see what I put on Appaloosa. Pink Parfait, of course, Cherry Cox. Leaning heavily on Cherry Cox because now I know that cherry flavor can be crossed in. And Appaloosa is very much like grenadine. I think it's gonna end up being kind of like an improved grenadine. Uh, our frenemy grenadine with all its problems and all its wonderful flavor. So it has all these crazy, you know, different fruit flavors in the mix. And who knows, maybe crossing it with Cherry Cox, for instance, will bring that out. Uh, Wittick Pippin is another one. I put Viking on it, which is a very complex, fruity flavored, uh, neat apple. Wittick Pippin just has a lot of crazy fruit flavors in it. Uh, Appaloosa also carries late hanging jeans, I hope, from Lady Williams. Crossing it with a few late hanging apples like Pink Parfait and Wittick Pippin may yield uh, good results. I Like I put March Hedge on it, that's super late, but it needs some flavor and interesting genes. Just while we're walking by, let's take a look at this tree that I trained. So this is a bite me tree. I used my bud clips here that I made in a, another day on the homestead video to train these branch angles outward. The only reason this one's way behind is because it was actually like a little stub um, and not a fat bud. So this is a very tiny bud that had to grow out. You can see I isolated it by removing everything around it. And I think this will gain some steam. But otherwise, consistently, you know, not in absolutely every case, but almost every case, where I notch above the buds, like this one right here, those shoots grow faster and more. And with the bud clip, I ensure that I get the angle I want. Highest priority when I get a new place or whatever I end up getting to work um, land, I'm going to prioritize this tree training research. Uh, but I need to put in, to do it right, I need to put in long rows 
of different species, you know, like persimmons, cherries, plums. I'm not only testing what I figured out so far, but I want to test some other ideas as well. Uh, and then come up with a system that's easy to understand that I can create like tutorial content for, like handouts that, that a nursery could just print out really easy and give to people, uh, videos, things like that to actually push the idea out. Because it's one thing to come up with it, but it's another thing to popularize it. I've done phase one, which is my own experiments and using this for years now and saying, hey, this really seems to work. Second phase is testing it more thoroughly with larger numbers in consistent conditions like nice, you know, well-controlled rows with healthy trees on different species. If I can get that put in place, I think within like five to seven years, maybe less, I'll be ready to start making that content and go into phase three, which is pushing the idea out there maybe finding a grad student that would be willing to take it on uh, for further testing for, you know, the people that need the science or think they need the science to do anything because they, they just are afraid. Um, but really, there's enough now for people to start using it and experimenting with it. And it's hard to do worse than the current recommendations, which is grow, take your tree, whatever it's like, and just cut it off and hope stuff grows the way you want it, which uh, in my experience, it rarely does. So yeah, support me on Patreon so I can get a piece of land and money to get these projects going because this is a game changer. If I can do this project in the next five to 10 years, um, it will result, very likely result in millions of you know people doing this different and getting results they want and, and also understanding the growth of the tree like that's why i call it smart tree training is like it's working with the physiology of the tree and understanding it a little bit and there's not that much to understand it's just a few key points and when you understand those points you understand why you're doing what you're doing and you can kind of riff off it and uh get creative you know in making the tree do what you want it to do so i have the fine end of the comb here and i can hold that actually while i do this and just rake these off we're gonna make a packet of cherry crush and list it right now and it's going to go quick on some varieties you can grab all the petals at once and kind of just Take them off like that. This is pretty well behaved. Some of them are just real crisp like this and they snap off easy. Earlier this year, I made this huge jar of packets just sitting watching TV. It takes about one minute per packet to fold these. I have to make thousands of them. Well, maybe hundreds a year for pollen and seeds. Number 10 white gel pen jelly roll. Uh, these have been really good. Not all gel pens are created equal. Some of them are, they all have a tendency to skip a little bit, but these are pretty good if you're careful. Hey, uh, shout out to Hack and Build. He convinced me to buy this label printer. Not this one, but a label printer. That was a lifesaver this year. I'll just work on these until my friend gets here get a little bit more ruby out. Otherwise, I can throw those in the fridge in a plastic bag and I can process them within a couple of days. Let's go to my website, Commerce, Inventory, Apple Pollen, Cherry Crush, One, Back, Save, and that's it. It's ready to go. When I do a pile of these, I'll just kind of like tap on these and tease out this stuff. And then any anthers that fall through, which is usually quite a few, there's like six or seven there, it looks like. Those I all sweep into the same container. So through the season, I'm collecting like this cool pollen blend of just everything that I'm saving pollen from. You know, I didn't make really any pollen blends this year because I was just too busy to even think about it. But I'm bummed because they're so cool. Talk about wild card crosses but it's like this focused chaos, right? I'm only using really good varieties, stuff that I would breed with, but each seed in the apple, or at least each cell, I'm not quite sure how that works, could be pollinated by a different parent. 
So that's just super cool. And again, it you know makes crosses that you might not take a chance on that could turn out really unique and cool. So I'm really into the pollen blends and in the future, given time or you know the garden and orchard manager I need to pull a lot of this stuff off, definitely more pollen blends are going to happen. It's really good for small scale. I wrote 2020 on that one. Oops. You know, people that are just dabbling because it gives you all this great variety in a single, like you could bag one branch, you know, of a tree and get this huge amount of variety of pollinations. You can also bag a branch and label each cluster differently if you have a bunch of different kinds of pollen. So, you know, my rule is if Anything above the flag is pollinated with whatever the tag says. Okay, I'm gonna make a couple packets of this blend up. Again, just everything I've used, collected pollen from through the whole season. Again, since these are dried, that's that's like a ton of pollen right there. And since I'm pretty much done collecting pollen, I'm just gonna bag one of these up for myself. Put an S with a circle, so I know that batch is my personal stash we'll call this season blend this is a gold mine of genetics right there so i got a pollen order in just now um, the reason i tape these down like this is because a letter can only be so thick to go through the mail with a single stamp and so i can't have the pollen packets bunching up you know in one side of the envelope or they'll they'll send it back but this will make it through with a single just regular letter stamp 